Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 1 of the Helping Children Learn podcast here at the Carbon Lehigh Intermediate Unit Number 21 in Carbon and Lehigh Counties in Pennsylvania. And I am here with some of our early intervention teachers. I'm here with Jen Prosak and our Annie Sullivan Award winner, Margie Rivera. Ladies, how are we today? Good. Thank you. So... I'm here for you, Margie, because you are Annie Sullivan Award winner. First off, congratulations. I know you Thank don't you. like to talk about it that much, but how exciting is that? It was shocking. Like, I never expected when they called my name, I never expected it. I, I listened to what they said, which I had no recollection of what they said, but I listened to what they were saying. And the last thing they said, I remember that she tells the kids, you're safe. And I turned over to Jen and I said, oh, I say that too. I had no idea that they were going to call my name next. So just to let everyone at home know, Annie Sullivan was the teacher for Helen Keller, who was a ended up being a lifelong companion until she passed away. So just to let everyone know, that's we, we honor an employee of the year, so to speak, after uh, Ann, Annie Sullivan. You heard Dr. Scott say these things you know, until you heard your name. What were you thinking? To be honest, because like Jen was talking, you know, we pour our lives into this kid. And I thought this could have been Jen or this could have been somebody else. Like I was thinking, oh, good. You know, and I do those things too. Again, not thinking that it was me, but just thinking, yeah, we do that. We're teachers. And then when they said that last time, the last thing about, you know, you're safe. And I thought, wow, I see that too. She said that to me. She said, (laughs) I say that too. (laughs) And again, that's how much I did not. No. And then when they said my name, I just kind of stood there for like five seconds. Like, what do I do? Like, I didn't know what to do. I think Jen told me, go. (laughs) And I just felt shocked, you know. And I have to say that we do what we do because we love it. But I felt validated, you know. Our methods are different than others. And... Many people will have different ways of the way that I do things, and I've heard it. But I felt validated. You know, I felt I love these kids, and it's showing. You know, somebody saw it. And then your family came out. So you're like, what is my husband and my kid doing here? my husband, I just wanted to cry. I did. My eyes were filled with tears, and my husband never let never gave me a clue. <laughs> never. It's a good husband. You know? And then my best right. friend, sister was there and my niece and then my daughter-in-law and my two grandkids came, which, you know, to share a moment that you never thought was ever going to happen with the people you love the most. What can I say? <laughs> I want to ask you, you're relatively new to the classroom. Talk about that. Yes, this is only my third year now, starting in September, will be my third year in the classroom. Before that, I was an itinerant teacher for four years. And then before that, most of my career, I worked with typically developing children. So Jen, you've seen the progression here. What has it been like to work with her? It's actually very nice because not only do we work well as a team, but we have different methods on how we teach and work with children. And we were able to work together to maximize our skills and share with each other our skills. And and we it's just been great. And I can't wait to keep growing with her and to grow um, the Carbon County Area School. Like, it's very exciting. So this is a question I ask everyone to start our podcast. And Marjorie, you can answer this, but how do you help children learn? What do you do when you come in here to make sure that you're helping your children learn? Honestly, when I first started the classroom, I was scared to death. And that's the truth. <laughs> Although I've been teaching since I was a little girl myself. Everyone is when their first job, um, right? But I was scared to death and I didn't know what to do. And I asked everybody that would answer me. And then I really, really honestly just prayed about it. And I just thought, you know what I need to do? I need to connect with them. So that really is what I aim to do. My number one goal in my classroom is to connect with my students. Jen, how would you answer that question? How do you help children learn? Well, I think it's fascinating that she says that because as much as we do things differently, I have very similar views Mm -hmm. because 
I was going to say, you have to know your kids inside out and backwards. Like you have to know them. You have to know what their interests are, where they are in baseline in terms of their learning. So you can help them grow in that way. And it, it makes a big difference. And children know who's invested and who's not. They really do. I worked with all kinds of population of students, even students that really have very little communication, very little movement, and they do know who's invested and who's not. And I think that is so important. I think some of our students are a little more empathic than maybe the average person. And so they read you and they feel you a little better. And really they feel you, right? Almost spiritually, they you do. know, like 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 a cosmic atmosphere, so to speak. And your bad vibes, your bad energy will... They pick up on it, for sure. And it is like obvious, like the last day of school, um, some of our children came in. It was going to be the last day. Some of them were going to go to kindergarten. And, and they came in and just to look at their smiling faces. You know, I looked at Tamara and and I looked at um, Heidi and I said, look at them. You know, they're just happy to be here. So we are at the Carbon County Early Learning Center. And this is part of our early intervention program. Just for people at home, what type of children, what, what type of uh, backgrounds are they coming from as far as their educational plan, their IEP? What type of kids are we teaching here? We have a range. Um, we have some children who are autistic, autism with a diagnosis, and they might be autis- autism three, two, or one. We have some children with just developmental delays, and Jen has some um, functional children, right? Right. They have more global delays that include physical disabilities. So one of the things that you were talking about connecting with our kids, what kind of put you on the map at the IU last year was, was Words Have Power. We made a video about it. So it if you go to the CLIU YouTube page and type in words have power, you will see the video that we made. Um, talk to us about what words have power is, what does it mean, and how did it get started? So one day we had one of those days. You can't be a teacher and not have one of those days. And it was in the morning only because we have morning children and we have afternoon children. And it was only the morning and they left and me and my girls looked at each other like, how are we going to do the afternoon? Like, this was absolutely <laughs> awful. And then I said, okay, guys, we always sit down for lunch and we kind of debrief and we talk. And so I said, now let's go over this. Let's look at what happened that was good today. And we had to take a deep breath because we were still overwhelmed. And we sat there and we just started writing all the positive. And it was really unbelievable that there was way more positive than there was negative. And yet we were capitalizing on the negative. And so the next day, Kathy came for a visit. She was my supervisor at the time. And so she always asked me how my class was going. And I told her what had happened the next day. And she said, oh, do you mind doing some documentation on that? And I'm like, no, that's how it happened. (laughs) So it was supposed to just be something that you did the debrief between AM and PM, turned into a demonstration, so to speak. Correct. And then also because, again, I'm new to this, I have already said that, I'm very open to new ideas. Like, how are we going to do this? And we had the speech therapist uh, that I had the second year, which was Lindsay. She has moved, but uh, she did a whole lot of different boards for me. And we saw children begin to use those functionally. So even though they still were nonverbal, they still could not talk, they could tell us what they wanted whether it was looking at a picture or by gestures. And one of the things that we talked about as a team is we need to respond to that. For example, I have a little girl who was very hungry and she can't tell me she's hungry because she doesn't have any words, but she went to the snack bin and opened it, (laughs) which is telling me I'm hungry. And one of the things that I believe is a hungry child cannot learn. And so that I just gave her a snack, you know, and I said, that is an example. When a child that's nonverbal communicates something, you want to be able to let them know that they're hurt, you know, whether it is that they're mad and they're throwing a tantrum. Well, you know, I might say, I see you're angry, you know, just give the word to the gestures power so they're more apt to do it again. Yeah. It's just the same way if you, if you repeat it back to them, they'll understand they're affirmed. Right. Correct. So a little bit of affirmation. Like, I, okay, she understood what I said, even though I didn't say anything. Right. I did something, which is speaking in action. Right. Correct. I'm sure you can understand that in a classroom, if you just focus on the bad, it'll eat you alive. No, absolutely. Yeah. We try and focus on the positive too and, and 
write down all the cute things that the kids do or say and, and that kind of thing. And then if something does happen that doesn't go our way, we try and think about how we can do it different next time. One of the things that you guys also did here at CCELC is the Budding Artists Art Show. And that wrapped around like a snake from Marty's room into Jen's room. Talk to us about the art show. To be honest with you, it was kind of the same thing. I told Kathy a story. And basically, I was hanging up some artwork that the kids did in the hallway just to hang them up and look out, make our hallway look pretty. And Sue, which is one of my IAs, said, oh, she also has a special needs adult. And so she knows what it is to be felt, to, be, to feel like she's outcast or her son is outcast. And so she said to me, oh, man, wouldn't it be great to have an art show? And I was like, that's a good idea. So I talked to Kathy. And I meant to do this little thing where parents are going to come and look at some artwork <laughs> before I knew it. It had become this massive thing. And then Jen had just started. Yes, here. I was going to say, I started with um, Carbon Lehigh at the very beginning of February. And she comes to me what, at the end of February, beginning mm -hmm. of March, says, we're going to have an art show at the end of March. And I was like, oh my gosh, why wait a minute, what? <laughs> I'm just trying to get oriented <laughs> here. I'm just trying to get settled in my classroom and now we're planning this big event. Yes, but it was wonderful because the way that we, again, we work together like if we had been working together for years. And that's the truth. I mean, that's the way I feel. She did something totally different. Like our styles are like night and day. She did these beautiful boards scenery. of scenery. Yeah, we did scenery. Yeah, talk about how we kind of got our kids together to, to do this art. Um, well, in my class, we, we thought it was fun to do different scenery. So they like dinosaurs. Dinosaurs is a huge thing. So we did a dinosaur theme and I cut out dinosaurs um, out of paper and they use like Legos and paint to decorate the dinosaurs. And then we did another scene of like flowers and caterpillars that the kids made. Um, and then in the hall, I think we had um, jars of lightning bugs with their fingerprints and things like that. So um, it was it was cute. And then I had little um, activities like Play-Doh and I had an art and craft activity on the table. So when parents came through, the kids could also participate in some kind of craft stuff. Yeah. So and then and then yours, Margie's was different. So now mine was different. Partly I, I have to give some kudos here to my daughter-in-law. I have a daughter-in-law. Uh, she is actually the art teacher in Jim Top School District. And so in the past, when I was working with typically developing children, she had helped me teach them real art, you know, as opposed to just color or whatever. Arts and crafts, crafty yes. things. And so we were literally just doing like actual artists, like Reggio or whatever, actual artists. And so I already had a little bit of that background. And so I thought, okay, which ones can I do with our children? And so I thought, okay, I can do the APC 1, 2, 3, the Johnsons. That's easy. I can do the Spatter art, the... the Jackson, action, action Jackson, I could do those things that were be easy because it, it takes movement and it's not just sitting there trying to color in minds or whatever. And so we just started working on it. And I worked honestly, for the most part, one or two kids at a time. And we would do and I would just, you know, like one of the, the ones that they all loved, it was just a box. When I did this in the past with my typical developing children, so I had to make adaptations. I just had like a marble and a tray and a paper and put. Yeah. And they chose their paint and they put it around the paper and then they moved it. Well, when I t thought about my children that I was doing this with, I got a closed box <laughs> so they could shake it which made it really exciting for them because they like that. They like the noise and they like- Real good sensory the noise, activity. The sensory activity. Yeah. And yet when they opened the box, I have some videos of them. When they opened the box and they looked at it, they went- <gasps> like, I did this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so and so I did that. And then, um, and then we just kept working on it and working on it and just working on boards. And before you knew it, I had this huge display. Um, and I, of course, I- individualizing, which, you know, we have to do with our population, actually, probably everybody should do, but definitely with our population, some children had more need, uh, have more needs than others. So there were some kids who wanted to do one and another and another, and there were some kids that were like, lady, I'm not sitting down. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> so okay. I chose my children based on their abilities to do different artwork. And then my daughter-in-law came the night before the art show to put it on display. <laughs> That's awesome. 
what do you think this, and you can both answer this, but between the words have power and, and, and having your children understood that they're heard, even if they're not speaking, right? Uh, and, 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 and for the art show, did you see a difference in your students after they got to see a product of their own work and then to feel like they were heard, right? Did you see a change in your children? I think it might not be immediate, but I think I did. But I had a little boy that came in and his eyes just opened so big as he's looking at this beautiful work. And so I saw that in individual children when they saw their artwork. But I also saw children, not the next day or the day after, but I saw when I look like Jen says, you know, we capitalize on the positives. And by the end of the year, when I look at the children and how much better they're communicating, I know that I know that I know it has to it has to do with the fact that they know they're heard and that they know that they're connected and and we care. You know, that this is the environment we create and we care. So they're OK. And there's a lot of other behaviors that had stopped because if you are heard fulfilled and you're fulfilled you're not going to go bang your head as often you know and so that's just an example that it wasn't magic it's not like oh i did this and the next day all my kids came in ready to talk it all makes sense it is a to z with the steps involved in the middle and the children were exactly like that some of them were like oh wow and they actually said oh wow Mm -hmm. and some of them were just as i look at the end of the year and Jen and I had had this conversation that we love the end of the year, that we love thinking where, even though she just started in February, but even since she started in February, she I know she's seen a lot of gains, Absolutely. you know? So Yeah, talk about the gains. Um, in this classroom, I've, I've seen a lot in terms of kids participating and relief of frustration, like Margie was saying, um, be- because not only are we starting to establish communication, but also because they do feel heard and they feel understood. I think that's really important for students that don't have communication or have limited communication that they don't feel understood. And there's a lot of frustration there, which does lead to some behaviors. Um, But getting to know those students, like we were saying so well, that even without communicating, I know, I know why they might not want to come to circle. I know why they're upset or, you know, or sitting at snack, why they're upset. Oh, because it's not, that's not what they like. You know what I mean? So just knowing the students and um, having that voice and then finding out what works for them. There's so, I mean, if you look behind you, you see so many different types of communication. There's all, there's switches. Mm-hmm. We've got communication boards. We've got different things. And what works for one student might not work for another. And you have to kind of switch it up and find what works for them. And it's such a re- relief for them to find what works that they can communicate in the way that they can and just feeling understood. So, I know you two will have a different answer probably based on what you said, but before we end this podcast, I like to ask one question, overarching question that kind of makes you reflect a little bit. Each year we have a question that we end a podcast with. For the, for this year, we're ending our podcast with what keeps bringing you back? What keeps making you go beyond all limits to help your kids? Because you know it's certainly not you know easy to do. And so, what keeps bringing you back? Honestly, for me, I truly love my job i truly love my kids i really do yeah okay let's economics right i have to work right but it's way more than you can do anything for work you can go work at costco i don't know that anybody (laughs) would do this job if they didn't at least like it you know but the truth of the matter i really do believe as god is my witness i really do believe this is what i was called oh my gosh this is my exact answer (laughs) Oh my gosh, I can't believe you said that. Yeah, I do too. I think that's just how God made me and that's what I was meant to do. I love my job too. I love these kids. I love seeing the progress. I love being a support person to the families. And I feel I feel valued and important with my job. I really do. I, I love it. And and I don't even know what else to say yeah. about it. Like I, I'm, I'm driving 45 minutes here and I don't care. I'm, I drove over an hour to my last job with Chester County IU. And I don't care because I love it. I absolutely love my job. I'm just going to close it up with this. That has to do with this. I told you the story yesterday. Yeah. Ever since I was a little girl, that's all I ever wanted to be. And a teacher. A teacher. And when I was about, and I did teach my children. So I, I'm older to this. I didn't go back to school to 2005 okay. when my daughter went to high school. I mean, my daughter went to college. So did I, that kind of thing. 
And so I did work non-traditionally, but when my son was about six years old, um, we were walking. I used to take turns with my kids on Saturdays to take them for breakfast. And I was walking the streets of New York and I was holding his hand and he looked at it. He looked at me. He said, Mama, what did you want to be when you grew up? And I looked at him and I said, a teacher and a mother. And he looked at me with his big brown eyes and he said, Mama, your wish was your command. <laughs> and that's the truth. It's really the truth. Well, I thank you both so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. This is season three, episode one, our inaugural episode for the new school year for the Helping Children Learn podcast. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you.